So Gregory, a lot of people in, the, in recent weeks have been celebrating what is seen as the kind of end or at least the ebbing of Mexican migration. And you wrote a great column. And what I mean by that, of course, is all the data that's showing that the flow across the river and across the border, I should say, um, peaked in 2007 and the numbers of you know, illegal crossings is down. The number of the undocumented population in the U.S. is starting to, to come down. And that would be expected given the recession. It would be expected given, uh, f you know, tightened uh, enforcement and also the demographic shift in Mexico. But I want to ask you, it was very interesting to see, to read a column that you wrote this week where you were kind of celebrating this in a way for very personal different reasons where you were talking about how, you know, the migration story has affected you in the last you know, couple decades. And talk a little bit about what you wrote in the LA Times. I, I, what, I'm, what I've always been concerned with and my interest in migration and my interest in Mexican migration in particular was how it would affect U.S. culture, how it would affect California culture. And I never really wrote about it, and I wrote about it this week, as you're referring to, is the extent to which it actually affected me personally. Because my, my family uh, is of Mexican origin, but we've been here, uh, for, you know, different grandparents came at different times, but the great-grandfather on my father's side came in 1890. So we, my father then was born in Los Angeles. My mother was born in San Diego. I was born in Los Angeles. So I, I'm a long-timer. and right. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sort of a, a suburban Cal Southern California. And so what, what, I, what I looked back on was the extent to which Mexican migration then, um, because of the way, well, I, I'll, I'll start simple, that how it, in, in a set framed my identity, uh, both internally and externally, how, how people assumed who I was and what the, what, the, what the meaning of Hispanic or Latino or Mexican meant over time since I was a kid. Right. I mean, you know, we collaborated together at the LA Times and I, I lived out there for three years and it's true that of all the people I met in LA, your family roots there probably trace back further than probably anybody else I, I met and any other friend I had in LA. And yet, I mean, what you point out in your in your column this week is uh, people always look to you to speak for the Mexicans who showed up yesterday. Right. So there was this presumption. So that despite my rootedness, because of my ethnicity, um, there was this presumption of newness. There was a presumption of foreignness. Um, and it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's something that I've had to battle with throughout. I've had editors I've worked with for years who suddenly... I have to have written about L.A. politics or American demographics will turn to me and ask me to write about Hugo Chavez. I, I have nothing against <laughs> writing about Hugo Chavez. But He's I very entertaining, been, Gregory. I've never been to Venezuela. Um, <laughs> but but there, were, there was this presumption of, I mean, one of the things I always say, quite bluntly, is in American intellectual life and beyond, if you're white, you can be an individual. If you're not, you are, you're immediately presumed to be a representative of a group, a standard bearer, a spokesman. I'm 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 a I'm a grouchy uh, sort of often rude, uh, irascible sort of <laughs> no. guy. I don't I don't really, I don't really get along with most people. And suddenly I found myself in a position of speaking for people. And and, and in a sense I always had to I always it it, beca it became sort of a burden. At the same time I'm trying to be honest about it. It became a job opportunity. It was the marketplace <laughs> open. I mean I I was going I had gotten into Harvard Divinity School. I wanted to be a theologian believe it or not. And this <laughs> mo demographic moment was happening. And I came back to LA to work with a medical sociologist who was working on Mexican, literally health data and Mexican immigration, what it was doing. He found that, he essentially found that uh, in the early 90s that the poorest group of women in California were having the healthiest birth outcomes or that the poorest group of men in right. California were living longer. And so I came to California to study what this would do to California culture. So um, I, I got, I think I got lost where I was going. But but in essence, I suddenly, um, I, I suddenly found myself in a position where pe newspaper editors were looking to, like, why can't you make sense of this for me? Right. It's, it's, and on one level, it's fair, because I, I, as a Mexican-American, I have had a long time in Mexico, but I'm not Mexican. And so I was actually interpreting something that was sort of affected me somehow, identified with, I didn't, I didn't entirely not identify, identify with it, but I wasn't of it. When you were saying you're grouchy, I, I kept looking at the coyote over your shoulder. But uh, <laughs> you know, I grew I grew up in, in in Mexico, as you know, and the relationship between uh, Mexicans and the diaspora here, Mexican Americans and Chicanos, 
um, is both a complicated one, but I feel like it's also one that's uh, changed a lot over time. I mean, what's what's your sense of that? And how do you, when you go to Mexico, has your sense of identification with this country from which your ancestors came, has that relationship changed as the border became more porous, as more Mexicans moved into LA? How's that dynamic changed over time? Absolutely, it's changed tremendously. And when, 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 for 30, 40 years ago, Mexican Americans could often find themselves by being, being none of the above. Anglos didn't see you as fully American, and Mexicans didn't see you as Mexican. Right. So Mexican Americanness, on some fundamental level, and, a, and a really part of me, is this net, being part of neither group. And so that's why I identify with the coyote behind me. Uh, <laughs> ultimate, ultimate can go anywhere and survive. You see the piece in the New York Times about ten coyotes in Golden Gate Park last month. I loved it. Anyway, wow. go. So, so of course, coyotes uh, also are the pe- are the ones who bring people across the border. Well, it, that's that complicates my definition. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> anyways um, so over time, though, Mexican began that, that sort of there was this sense that that, that, that uh, through the, the you know the, the derogatory term bocho, this which right. you know, as you know translates as a sort of watered down Mexican. Um, and in essence, there was this notion that I mean, we the those who left were an embarrassment. Um, in the early 20th century, something like 10% of Mexico had left north. So we were the living embodiments of, of, of Mexico's failures on some level. And Mexicans, both, uh, both, uh, both nationally, uh, on a national official level, and on a, on a per- personal family level, and this, happened, well, this happens with all sorts of migration, will have misgivings about those who left home and may have done better. And so there was a little bit of jealousy, there was tension, and there was a sense, well, well, you may have gone to the United States. You may right. have gained certain things, but you have you 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 clearly lost culture or sold your culture. But in the last twenty years, that that situation seems to have changed, and and and, and there's been a warmth, in, in fact. And I can go to Mexico now, and in essence, um, there is not this great distance. There's not this presumed distance between Mexicans and Mexican Americans as there had been. There's there's because a poll seemed to show that there's so many Mexicans have family and friends in the United States. That it's almost normalized the image of the Mexican American uh, in Mexican eyes. I think that's right. I mean, I think the the, ch- the political changes in Mexico, the opening and the sort of greater democracy meant that Mexican the Mexican government could no, no longer had to be in denial about its citizenry in the United States. Um, they saw it as an economic opportunity. Vicente Fox, when he became president, really capitalized on this. And in fact, the opposition to the PRI, which ruled Mexico for 70 years, always saw the uh, Mexican Americans on this side of the border as potential allies, and the PRI was naturally nervous about them. So it's kind of natural that 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 would shift things. Um, I also think it's interesting how these personal connections have um, served to soften, I think, how Mexicans see the U.S. Uh, There's there's been a a significant... um, lessening of anti-Americanism in Mexican society generally. And I think it's because, as you said, every, every family or every person has a, a friend or a relative who's gone, who, who goes back and forth. And so the, you know, the behemoth, the imperio to the north, starts looking very differently as it's experienced, if not firsthand, through the experiences of your, of your primo or, or your, you know, uh, right. your, your parent that's sending you remittances and so forth. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, that shift. What about, um, so here you are, I mean, on the one hand, you kind of resent the, the quickness with which uh, newspaper editors over time or others, you know, put this label on you and expect you to be sort of the expert on all things immigration and, and all things happening, you know, between, uh, you know, Tijuana and uh, Argentina, because you're the Latin guy. Um, but to what extent do you really, do you feel that you should be a voice for Mexico and the U.S. and that part of, um, you know, the, the community even as it has assimilated in the U.S., whether it's over, you know, three or four generations, as in your case, or whether it's people who are just going through the process of naturalizing as U.S. US citizens, to what extent should they be a, uh, a voice for, a more, you know, a stronger engagement with Mexico from the U.S. perspective or better relations or, I mean, we see this dynamic play itself out for, obviously, for very different, in different ways and for different reasons with, like, Cuban Americans who remain very much engaged with what's happening back in Cuba. Uh, You see it with the Armenian community in Los Angeles. And because that border 
was was pretty uh, uh, tight in some ways in the previous generations with Mexico. That hasn't quite occurred. I mean, do you feel it like you need to sort of be a voice for a different approach to Mexico and for more uh, a greater priority being placed on this relationship, or is that is that again sort of insulting to you for me to even suggest that? No, it's not insulting at all. It's just that I, the only, it's not insulting. It's just that I don't believe anybody should be obliged to be anything. Uh, I think mean, that that's right. just against just my better like my judgment about humans. Uh, I, you know, I don't think every woman who walks should speak to me on behalf of all women. I mean, that right. that's a, there's a product point. That's not about ethnicity. This is about I, I'm I'm I I just I I believe in everybody just being having the right and the and the joy uh, to speak for themselves. Or uh, but. Uh, my my attitudes toward Mexican uh, the role of Mexico officially is 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 is, is informed by my knowledge of uh, Mexicans' interaction with Mexican American Mex official Mexico. And it's it's been a complicated one. Mexico helped the United States uh, deport the millions of Mexicans, uh, rather repatriate, rather forcefully, uh, uh, in, 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 during the depression. Mexico has not necessarily been a friend of its, its diaspora, of its expatriates for 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 most of its most of our history. And right. Um, and when, when you know when the U.S. was kicking out Mexicans, uh, the the Mexico saw it as a great gain in their economy to have these people who were trained in the exterior and then to be incorporated into the economy back home. But so I, I just what I've resented over time was the extent to which news media has gone to Mexico to speak for the millions and tens of million people who left Mexico. Right. I mean, you know, I resented you know the Los Angeles Times asking the former foreign minister of Mexico uh, to speak for. Uh, uh, and then this is a this is also a class racial to speak for the you know the 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 the, the, the people the, the the people who are maids in Los Angeles. It's, there's a disconnect, and, and so the, what's interesting about the relationship is the extent to which these people become stateless. Is this nether world that Mexican migrants and the, the expatriates it seem to inhabit? And I think the way Washington looks at it, it looks like a very that's official. Like these people, they left here. Right. And they're represented by the homeland. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's more important in the end, I don't know if this answers your question, that the people be integrated as successfully as possible into their new land. Um, go ahead. Well, that, that segues into my one thing I just kind of want to get your, your take on. If, if there's a sense that, um, you know, there's a period now of consolidation of this previous bulge of migration, if indeed the numbers have peaked, and we're, we are seeing a decrease in the crossings. Um, do you see this as a, as a period of time when society can sort of assimilate that, that fervid, you know, pace of immigration in the 90s and, and early in the last decade? I mean, you, you um, I mean, some of the studies that came out in the last week or so from the census data, and I think some of this was in your column too, um, contrast the number of native-born Latinos in L.A. Um, in 1970 with... Um, you know, more recent years where it's just uh, really com com the proportions really got out of whack in terms of the, the percentages of Latinos who were born in the States versus not. Right. Um, do you think that this will be having a pause to these levels, if not an, an end to these levels of migration, um, are, are going to have a positive kind of effect in terms of uh, social cohesion? Uh, you are the director, after all, of the social Center for Social Cohesion, so I should ask you this, and, and assimilation or... Well, assimilation had always occurred. It, 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 the assimilation doesn't require uh, immigration to stop. I mean, that, 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 that's another subject. But it, it will. It, migrants did adapt and always adapt to the new land as, as they saw fit, um, in, in, a, in a very simple sense to make to, to be able to negotiate their lives better for, for themselves and for their children. So adaptations and language acquisition and all sorts of behavioral changes happened naturally over time. And uh, the, the, whether the, the, the height of migration may have allowed people to uh, uh, to maintain um, um, old world networks or, 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 or you know, homeland taste more than they did, but it didn't really impede fundamentally assimilation over time. But but it will do. It's not about the assimilation factor. It's about society reweaving its network. It's or not reweaving, recreating them. Right. It's a Mexican migrant or the child of Mexican migrant and the child of Korean migrant. The child is high migrant, creating a, a new community, and it's about it's about rootedness. Uh, right now, the the, the, the midterm municipal election in Los Angeles so it had a, something like 11 percent turnout. Um, this is striking. We live in a very fluid city. Right. Uh, one of the things that struck me living in Koreatown in Los Angeles that once I was trying to write 
something about what was the neighborhood was like in 1970. I could not find a person who was here in 1970. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, and, and it's just the beauty and wonder and dynamism of Los Angeles. So right. I, I want to make sure that I point out the fact that we're going to lose something. The immigration creates economic and cultural vitality, and we're going to lose some of that. We are going to become more of a staid society. There's no doubt about it. We're going to have shittier restaurants. Excuse me, this is a, a think tank for, uh, uh, <laughs> conversation. But the, but the point is, and so there is, there's something lost. There's this, this, this collision and convergence of, of, of nations, of tastes, of cultures, of attitudes, of religions is a wonderful thing. And I, I you know, port cities are great. And we were a port city. But the, and I'm saying, and I, that's not a, just a one great event. I'm saying we're transitioning in a new time, which we should all should make great which is a time of rootedness and a place where we share a heritage, which is, in my case, Los Angeles. Right, right. Um, so, as, so to answer your question, it's, it's a very important to social cohesion. Yeah. I mean, we got to get, we, the, 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 the caveat is we really did get along better than anyone gave us credit for, but I think, but we weren't rooted in a sense of in taking care of our own community. Right. So just uh, to connect this story, which was sort of the big demographic story of a couple of weeks ago, the the data that showed that uh, uh, immigration from Mexico is decreasing. To connect that to the big new, the big demographic news of this week, which is census data showing that last year, uh, you know, non-Hispanic uh, white births accounted for less than 50% uh, for the first time in the U.S. and that's getting a lot of uh, buzz um, today and this week. Um, so if if we're going to have fewer Mexican immigrants and uh, we're having fewer non-Hispanic white babies, are we just going to run out of people someday? Or how, what's the, uh, the, tre the thread line between these two stories? Well, I, I, I do think at some point we will be looking uh, elsewhere for migration. But that's another story, uh, which I'm not, I, I'm not in a place to really talk about at this point. But I, I do think the, I, I think the, the, the story we've seen, this, we've heard this drumbeat for 20 years. And it may be national, but in California, we saw this drumbeat every other week in Los Angeles time. Latino babies or Latino, whatever it was, Latino students, Latino whatever. And to some extent, it's overblown because it's kind of irrelevant on some level. I mean, you mean the whites, whites becoming a minority is irrelevant? Yeah. I mean, we saw this. And what happens if California is any example, you have this frenzy of concern. The significance is over, it, it, it's overestimated. But ultimately, what you have in front of you, you have a population that like, no matter if it's, you know, zebra, you have a population you have to educate, that you hope is healthy, that you hope is, is trained, that you hope can sustain a tax base, that you hope uh, can, can, you know, can, <laughs> can, can fight wars, you can right. you hope that creates wealth, and that it, it's a really a distraction on some level. But so and why, so, I mean, we can stipulate all that, but but then why is, why the anxiety, or why the titillation in the media over this the situation of the media point. is, at essence, there is there is a racial aspect, and it's not probably not a pretty one. It's this presumption that people are, over time, we used to, I would say, we had a more sophisticated view of ethnicity at some point. It's malleable, it's changeable, and people change over time and acculturate and, come, and, and from different places. At a certain point in the late 20th century, we started looking, we started seeing ethnicity in terms of race. And race has always been seen as biological, unmovable. Right. And this tied into multiculturalism, this notion that, that people don't change over time. Not only that they don't change over time, or that they shouldn't change over time. But the fact of the matter is they do. Uh, you know, when I went to Berkeley in the 80s, and a lot of stupid things were said, and, and I always <laughs> joked, like, you're against assimilation, it's, being against, it's like being against hurricanes. Like, great. Right. You know, I, I mean, again, it, so, so this notion is we have this static view of culture, that somehow the, the Latinos, I mean, the way I look at it is like in 1910, could a, a Hungarian uh, uh, Jewish rabbi have ever like imagined would be Allen? You know, could an Italian migrant in 1898 have imagined Dean Martin? The point is, this is still this is still in the United States. Right. It's still one of the vital culture, not the most in the world, and the people are churned. And and ideally, if they're going to take advantage of the wonders of the country, they will make of their ethnicity. Uh, what in ways that we can't even imagine. So I think I think it's this notion that people, this Hispanicity is this fixed element that goes over time, and that you know they're going to be drinking you know eating out of margaritas out of baby bottles in some in 2060. But I think it, I think it's a much more dynamic picture than that. Right. 
I thought you would get. I thought I'd get a laugh from that one, but I guess not. You got a, You got a little chuckle here, but I'm. I'm trying to be, you know, uh, restrained because I'm in Washington. And you're the one in, in LA.